It is good to see everybody here. My name is Matthew. Uh, most folks call me by my last name, Watson, if I haven't met you. Um, I want to read uh, the scripture that Justin will preach from today. This is um, going to be from Deuteronomy 6. And so I want to ask you to stand uh, to reverence the reading of God's word. This comes from Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them down on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. God, we thank you for this moment and this morning. We thank you for these gathered saints that are here. We're grateful for um, your, uh, your providence over us, your protection, your guidance. God, as we consider your word in Deuteronomy 6, I pray that you'd be with Justin as he comes to open up the scriptures for us and remind us of all of the ways and all of the invitations that you extend to us to love you because you first loved us. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Good, good morning. Good morning. Andrea warned me last week that I should not try to wear an over-ear microphone with my mask, and I did not listen to her. That is my own fault. Uh, Welcome, everyone, to those who are joining us here at Minor for the first time since March 2020. To those who are joining us online as well, we are so glad that all of you are with us. Last last week, we had a a soft launch and dress rehearsal uh, with our volunteers in preparation for this week, and so now we're here. And now that we're here, I need your help, especially those who are here in person at Minor. I and the rest of the preaching team for most of the last two years um, have spent our time talking to a camera with very little sense of what we were saying uh, was good or dumb. And so if I am saying something good, something uh, something that slaps, something that uh, you needed to hear, it helps me if you let me know. Okay? That can range from an amen. Okay, we need to exercise our muscles to a preach, to a yes, Lord, all the way down to snaps, all right? Or if you are so overcome by the Spirit that you have no words, you can just raise a hand. I will know you're not asking to go to the bathroom. (laughs) On the flip side, if things aren't going so well, a a, a simple help him Jesus will convey the message. (laughs) This week, as we begin gathering once again in person here at Minor, we're also beginning a new sermon series. It's called Who We Are, as Nikki shared, Who We Are. Over the next three weeks, we'll be examining who we are as a church, as a faith community, and who we are as individuals, the road that God invites each of us to walk. Now, even before the pandemic, we were feeling the need to articulate anew the values and the vision of our church. This past summer, marked four years uh, since we became Christ City Church. And the four years before that were spent as the East Side Parish of the District Church. There were values, there were practices, ways of saying things and doing things that we inherited or that had become implicit in our culture over the years. Not necessarily in a bad way, but just as... Uh, Dave, can we turn off the monitor? I think it's coming through. Just as a, a child... Oh, no, it's off. Just as a, just thank you. Thanks, Akai. That's it, that's it. Just as a child growing up learns to speak for themselves, learns to claim their own values, learns to articulate what they believe and not just what they were told to believe, there was a sense that we as a community needed to do that for ourselves as well. And so over the last year or so, our leadership council, which is mostly made up of our small group leaders, our ministry team leaders, our elders and our staff, we took time to revise our vision and our mission. We asked questions like, what's God calling us to? And has it changed since we started? 
What is the particular shape of Jesus' followers that comes through our church? How do we go about our mission of empowering every member to be a Christ-bearer in the places they, you, live and work? What are the values that shape not just what we do, but how we do it? Today I get to share with you where we landed on our vision and mission as those are important pillars for this series. And you'll find all of this as well as some core practices and core values that we may unpack another day. You can find all of it on our website and so you can read it and ruminate on it as you need. To jump right in, our vision, our vision is this, to see the flourishing of God's kingdom on display in every life and every sphere of life in DC and beyond. To see the flourishing of God's kingdom on display in every life and every sphere of life in DC and beyond. That prayer that we pray every week to see God's kingdom come on earth as in heaven, that remains as it has always been, as central to our calling. That's the reality Jesus came to inaugurate. That's the reality He commissions us to continue seeking. Now, some of the language around our vision statement has changed to reflect our expanding parish. We will always care about the immediate neighborhoods surrounding Minor Elementary, Rosedale, H Street, Capitol Hill, Kingman Park, Trinidad. Where we worship is always a, an epicenter of responsibility. But we are no longer just a parish church where almost everyone lives within walking distance as we once were. We have folks who are joining us from all over DC, from Maryland and Virginia, and now because of the pandemic, even from around the country and around the world. And all of us are called to care for the neighbors and the neighborhoods around us, the places we live and work and worship, wherever they may be. And so we seek the flourishing of God's kingdom on display in every life and every sphere of life in DC and beyond. Our mission is how we get there. It's how we seek to fulfill that vision. Our mission has three parts which form the three weeks of this series. Love God, love others, make disciples. Love God, love others, make disciples. Simple, short, memorable, not unique, but revolutionary. Truly revolutionary. It's the interweaving of what Jesus called the great commandments in Mark 12, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, which we'll talk more about today. Love your neighbor as yourself, which Lisa will talk about next week. And the great commission that Jesus gave to his followers in Matthew 28, as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Watson will talk about that in week three of our series. Love God, love others, make disciples. We don't need to complicate things when Jesus made them pretty simple. We have a straightforward mission statement that doesn't take very much energy to uh, remember so that we can spend our energy actually doing it. And so I'm excited for how we relearn worshiping together again and, and, and specifically for these next few weeks as we re-examine these three commands of Jesus. It is my hope and prayer that we will plumb new depths and find a deeper spring of life than we ever have. Today I get to preach on the first part of our mission, the, on what Jesus called and what Jews to this day still call the greatest commandment. To reread it in its Old Testament setting, the words of God through the prophet Moses to the people of Israel about to enter the promised land. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Love God. Love God. I remember when I was a student in high school and then also in college, it was drilled into me when I was taking exams. Read the question. Answer the question. Don't just put down what you know, whether it's relevant or not. Make sure you're doing what is asked of you. And so when I think of the instruction to love God, my next questions are, well, what is love and who is God? If I'm to do this, I need to know what the constituent parts are. The setting is Beacon Hill School on Edie Road, just outside of the Lion Rock Tunnel in Kowloon Tong, Hong Kong, 1987. First grade. That was the first time I fell in love. Her name was Oriana, which means golden 
according to the book of baby names that was on my parents' bookshelf <laughs> and probably still is. She was in my class and if our slides were working, you would get to see a picture of me in first grade. So that's our motivation. We're gonna get that up for next week. Or you can go back on the stream and check it out. Now, I say that it was the first time I fell in love. I don't think anybody ever told me what love was. Uh, at some point during my childhood and at several points afterwards, my dad would say, we don't fall in love, it's a choice. But at five years old, that didn't make sense to me. All I knew was I, I felt funny when, she was, when I was around her and she was beautiful and fun and kind, and so that was love to me. I loved her in second grade, too. And in third grade, when I got to invite her to my birthday party, that was an absolute win. And then in fourth grade, and in fifth grade. Fifth grade was when I finally got the courage to tell her how I felt. It was December 1992. And I got a piece of paper and I folded it in a four to make a Christmas card and I decorated the front and I wrote some generic greeting on the inside, I hope you have a great Christmas. But under one of the flaps, I wrote something like P.S. I really, really like you. Please don't show this to anyone else. <laughs> Classic 10-year-old wooing technique. I think I may have even been brave enough to, to hand it to her in person. My heart captured in a homemade Christmas card. It probably took no more than 10 minutes before the rest of the class had seen it. I mean, everyone in the class already knew that I liked Oriana, but now they knew. After that year, her family moved across town and she moved to a different school. I don't think it was because of the card. <laughs> but even seeing her in sixth grade when my school traveled to hers to play a soccer match, the, well, the heartbreak could not hold a candle to the puppy love. I mean, my first love lasted five years, half my life at the time. <laughs> Poet Maya Angelou wrote, love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, leaps fences, it penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. I love that. It recognizes no barriers, jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. But over the years, I've learned that those things don't just happen. Love isn't just fluffy sentimentality. It isn't just heady highs and extravagant gestures. It isn't just about romance. I learned that from relationships that worked and then didn't. I learned it from friendships that offered more consistency and company than some of those relationships. I learned it from watching my parents navigate life together, now 53 years into marriage. But I learned it from scripture too. My current working definition of love is to will the good of the other. To will the good of the other. To seek the good of the other in tangible action. In the words of Pastor Eugene Peterson, love isn't a sentimental way of feeling, but a sanctified way of living that respects the value of other people. Real love, not just the abstract value, not just the thin facade of love in our culture, but the tangible action, the deep love of God, that's hard. It requires sacrifice, effort, intentionality, attention. We may need to lay down some things we've held on to for the sake of others so that we might arrive at our destination full of hope. What I thought was love in my childhood, in my youth, it doesn't look at all what I understand love to look like now seven years into marriage with two kids under the age of three or with friendships that now have spanned decades. Love now looks like taking out the trash, folding the laundry, changing poopy diapers, waking up in the middle of the night to hold an inconsolable child as of six hours ago. Love now looks like being intentional and scheduling phone calls or catch-ups with friends when life might otherwise squeeze them out. Life now looks like 
couples counseling and working hard to create spaces with quality time, to have quality time with my wife so that we don't just end up as a good parenting team. Love now is striving to look more and more like the love in 1 Corinthians 13. That is patient and kind. That isn't jealous, that doesn't brag, that isn't arrogant, that isn't rude, that doesn't seek its own advantage, that isn't irritable, that doesn't keep a record of complaints, that isn't happy with injustice, but is happy with truth. Love for me now applies to far more than just a romantic partner, but also to, to friends and family, to neighbors and strangers and enemies, to those I see every day and those I may never meet, and to God. In the ancient Near East, which is the context of much of the Old Testament, the language of love, interestingly, was also used in the world of politics and international relations to describe the complete loyalty and allegiance that was expected from a king's subjects or from a vassal nation. Love was not about feeling at all. It was about doing. It was about bringing all of your life into alignment with that loyalty and allegiance. It was about avoiding the things that would diminish that loyalty or compromise that commitment and pursuing the things that would augment that loyalty, strengthen that commitment. And scholars note that all of the commandments, all of the laws subsequently named in the Old Testament, hundreds of them, all of those laws flow from that one commandment to love God. This is what it looks like. And that's what's also communicated with the phrase, the full phrase, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You can break it down into the constituent parts of our being, our will, our emotions, our bodies. That can be helpful too. But the point is that the loving response to God, both for us as individuals and as a community, encompasses every aspect of our being, every resource at our disposal, and every moment of our life and every relationship therein. That's what's captured in the following verses of Deuteronomy 6. Moses continued after saying the greatest commandment, he said, Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the door doorposts of your house and on your gates. Love of God is intended to be a response of total commitment. A sanctified way of living that includes and impacts all of our time and our energy and our abilities and our possessions and our relationships. And that's what we mean when we say every life and every sphere of life. That's what Jesus meant when he said, seek first the kingdom of God. Love of God should define everything in life. Now, as I was preparing this sermon, there was a question that I discovered lurking in the background which is how do we understand this commandment to love God as an invitation to life rather than a threat back to injunction? Because I do believe with all of my heart that it is the former rather than the latter, and yet I know that there remains for many of us the possibility, the shadow, however faint, of the idea that God is actually an angry, petulant, divine judge who just wants his way and wants to spoil the fun for the rest of us. At the beginning of Deuteronomy 6, Moses says, Now these are the commandments, these are the regulations, the case laws that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you to follow in the land you are entering to possess. Listen to them, Israel. Follow them carefully so that things will go well for you. You could read that either way, couldn't you? As an invitation to life or as a threat back to injunction. Follow them and things will go well for you. Don't follow them. And well, this is sort of an offer you can't refuse. And this is where who is speaking is important. Who is being revealed? Who is to be loved? You can think of God as some distant higher power, and many do. But the God of the Old Testament has a name. Yahweh. Yahweh is perhaps the closest guess for how to pronounce something in Hebrew that is a series of consonants. It's a name considered so holy that Jews will instead say Adonai. It means the Lord. In our English Bibles, so where you see this capitalized form of the Lord, know that it is referring to Yahweh. 
This is God's personal name. It was revealed for the first time in the book of Exodus when God recruited Moses to be part of his rescue plan. And again here in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one, or Yahweh alone. Some translations say Yahweh is one, while others say Yahweh alone is your God. And when Jesus interpreted this verse in Mark 12, he said, God is one, and beside him there is no other. And so the correct translation is both. God is one, and God alone. Yahweh is one. God's actions line up with God's words. God is consistent. God is trustworthy. God will do what God says. And Yahweh alone is worthy of our allegiance and our commitment. Not only that, the, the God Israel is, is commanded to love is their God. Right? Their God, the one who is for them, the one who just one chapter earlier in Deuteronomy 5 reminded them, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. God's character and God's trustworthiness and God's side were revealed during the ultimate act of deliverance and liberation for the people of Israel. In the words of theologian Deanna Thompson, God's oneness is inseparable from God's identity as liberator. Let me say that again. God's oneness is inseparable from God's identity as liberator. Thus, the great commandment begins with the affirmation that this God who gives Israel commands to follow is the God who freed Israel from bondage. The same God who gave them life beyond slavery also gives them life through the commands. This God is undivided in identity. Just a few chapters later, still in Deuteronomy, we get this. Yahweh your God is the God of all gods and Lord of all lords, the, the great, mighty, and awesome God who doesn't play favorites, doesn't take bribes. He enacts justice for orphans and widows, and He loves immigrants, giving them food and clothing. And that means you must also love immigrants because you were immigrants in Egypt. This is the God of the Old Testament, the one who stands with those whose backs are against the wall those who are vulnerable, those who are marginalized. This is the God who says in Isaiah 61, I, Yahweh, love justice. I wish more of us could know and love this God rather than the one who is caricatured in the Old Testament, the one who just punishes every small wrongdoing unless you beg for forgiveness, or the one who's just waiting for you to fail, or the one who is capricious and unpredictable and inconsistent, or the one who just doesn't care all that much about what goes on down here. So you don't have to twist my arm to love a liberating God. To love a just God. To love a God who defends the vulnerable and the immigrant. That's the God I want to believe in. That's the God I need to call on in these days. When I look at pictures of Haitian immigrants, migrants being whipped by border patrol officers on horseback, or the growing economic inequality that leaves so many scrambling while a few live in luxury, a stolen luxury, or this continuing selfish prioritization of one's own rights and privileges over the lives and livelihoods of others, whether it relates to COVID or the climate crisis. And this God is revealed even more clearly in the New Testament, in the person of Jesus Christ. In John 14, Jesus said, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, referring to Yahweh. And in Colossians, the Apostle Paul wrote, In Jesus, all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. If we want to know what, who, who God is, we can look at God's actions in the Old Testament, God's liberating and rescuing acts. But we see God most clearly in the person of Jesus, in His life and His death and His resurrection. What Jesus is like is what God is like. Okay? What Jesus is like is what God is like. The one who preached good news to the poor, who welcomed sinners, ate with outcasts, who healed the untouchable, who called out hypocrisy, who confronted injustice, who loved with his entire being, even to death on a cross, so that we might have life. The God who was revealed most clearly in the Old Testament in the liberation and deliverance of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt was revealed even more clearly in the New Testament. 
in the liberation and deliverance of all creation from slavery to sin and death and all that through Jesus Christ. That's how I know love God is an invitation to life because Jesus, God himself, died to open the way to life. And when the Apostle John wrote the revolutionary words that God is love, he had seen it with his own eyes in the flesh. And when Jesus says, I have come that they may have life to the full, he meant that we could learn to live lives of love. You see, the command to love God is preceded by and surrounded by and encompassed on all sides by the love that this same God had for us first. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We love because God first loved us. Because of what Jesus did on this earth, because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of what Jesus did in overcoming sin and death, the Apostle John is able to write, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. We are children of Yahweh, the just, the righteous, the holy, the loving. When I was in college, I recommitted my life to Christ. And for the first year or so after that, whenever I would pray and ask God to, to tell me something, share something with me, the thing that I sensed God saying most often to me was, I love you. And I'd be puzzled. I mean, I'd say to God, you know, I, I know that. I mean, everybody knows that. Jesus loves me, this I know. But the Bible tells me so. And I've been hearing this my whole life. This is an old lesson. I ain't got that one. The same thing. I love you. Day after day. I love you. Week after week. I love you. And one day, I realized that God was telling me he loved me so often because that was the most important thing about who I was. And that was the thing that was most easy to forget. When something goes wrong, something bad happens, technical difficulties, someone gets mad at you, when someone hurts you, when things don't go the way you want them to go, when things are out of your control, or even, th even when things are going really well, any time, any place, the thing that's easiest to forget is also the thing that changes everything, the thing that grounds everything. God loves you. Yeah. Because God, because Jesus is who Jesus is, we can be who we were made to be. We can be free to do all the things that God calls us to do, including loving God in return. Because we were first rooted in the unshakable soil of God's love. And so, no matter who you are or how you understand yourself right now, God loves you. No matter what you've done or what's been done to you, God loves you. Whatever hand the last couple of years has dealt you, whatever hand your life has dealt you, whatever has happened to you in spite of your best efforts, whatever this week has thrown at you, whatever today has dumped at your doorstep, whatever accomplishments you will or will not accomplish or achieve this year, whatever challenges we as human beings, as a human race, will or will not overcome, God says to you, I love you. Oriana may have been the first girl I fell in love with, but I was loved long before then. From even before time began. Now the God who is love. Church, as I said at the beginning, I believe with all my heart that we find life in learning how to truly love God to bring every aspect and element of our lives under the Lordship of Christ, to pledge our every asset and every breath to the liberating work of the Spirit. And, 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 and I want to encourage us all to discern how to do that a little bit more this week, how to love God a little bit more, how to give over a little bit more control 
to God, how to loosen our white knuckle grip on our little kingdoms. But maybe we get there, not just by gritting our teeth and trying harder, but by learning how to rest in the love of God for us. Learning how to recognize the ways God's Spirit has been delivering us already. Maybe it is learning to sit still long enough without a screen in front of our faces to hear God say, I love you. And then to stay in that place of discomfort long enough to let it permeate every dark and shadow and shame-ridden corner of our lives. And thus we might find life in the liberation of a loving God. What transformation would come into each of us and to all of us as Christ City Church, to this city that we love and to this world we inhabit. In the words of the monk Thomas Merton, to say that I am made in the image of God is to say that love is the reason for my existence. For God is love. Love is my true identity. Selflessness is my true self. Love is my true character. Love is my name. Would you pray with me? Life is found in you. Hope and joy are found in you. And God, whatever we're, we're dealing with as we enter in this space, whatever we're wrestling with, whatever things we don't want to let go of, whatever things we're trying to manufacture an outcome for. Spirit, would you bring home the truth to us that we are loved? That you first loved us. So that we might know your love and we might love you in return. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.